Hey everybody, how are you? And thank you for joining me today on this Halloween. Happy Halloween, everybody. Happy Halloween, Kurt. You dressing up tonight with your wife? Uh, I <laughs> That's am a not, loaded no. question. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, my guest today in studio is Patrick Kilpatrick. What an interesting man you are. You are the author of Dying for Living, the first of a two-part series. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Aren't nice. you going to be doing a book signing here in L.A.? I am a Saturday... Um at the Barnes and Nobles in Casablancas, uh, Casablancas. We were talking about Morocco. Wait a minute, you're going to Calabasas. Morocco for this? We were just talking Calabasas. I, Calabasas. We were just talking about Morocco because I just returned from there a week ago, and yeah. he was telling me he got engaged there, and we were going on and on about Morocco. And um, so your book signing is next week in. It's this Saturday, two to four at Calabasas, Calabasas. and my special guests are Art Camacho, the legendary uh, martial arts director. Oh. And, and uh, stunt choreographer in Costas Mandalore. Uh, we try to get some celeb friends at these things oh, to absolutely. do readings and things like that. So. It's also a great bookstore, I have to say. It's worth the trip um, to Calabasas to go and uh, meet you to talk about your book. But let's talk a little bit about you, your background, and why you decided to write this book. What I love is you have over 170 credits to your name. Mm -hmm. um, pretty much you've played the villain in so many films. Yeah. Um, is that what you always wanted to do when you started out in the business? No, I think your my goal at the beginning in acting was to, uh, to work consistently, which I did. Um, and then after about five years, you want to be only in A-list projects and the highest level you can. Your goals and aspirations are always changing. Um, the villain thing, one of the examinations of the book was how I ended up doing that. Um, uh, I think I mentioned to you, uh, I, I, after the book, I, I started thinking that in second grade I did a play and they made me the villain. <laughs> and so... Uh, Somewhere along the line, I, I think I had a fire and I had a sort of exuberant craziness and they would uh, plug me in on that. A lot of it is institutional typecasting in Hollywood, too. I suppose. But let's talk about some of the people that you've starred opposite. Uh, hmm. Tom Cruise, Bruce Willis, Sean Connery, one of my favorites, Naomi Watts, uh, Mr. Schwarzenegger. Uh -huh. I mean, just to name a few. Mm -hmm. What an esteemed career. That's pretty something. So who'd you who did you play? What did you play? What was your character opposite Tom Cruise? And what was that like when you walk on set and there's Mr. Cruise? Well, I, I was uh, actually a wonderful Hollywood moment. I didn't even have to audition or meet Steven Spielberg for that job. He hired me off of James Cameron's uh, Dark Angel. Wow. And uh, so... Um, uh, Meeting Tom is extraordinary, and he's an extraordinary person, uh, very warm, very... Uh, people always think you're sort of shining that on by saying those things, but no, as I do in the book, I'm very candid about uh, the people I've worked with. He's a great guy, particularly to do an action movie with. He's very dedicated uh, to putting out what I call a great product, but telling a, re a really great story, as is Steven Spielberg. And uh, he was always very solicitous. My kids would come to the set. He would put them in a nice position and have them call action, as was Steven Spielberg. Oh. So he was great. He's very, very, um, really, really insightful and dedicated to putting out a, a great movie. Spielberg. What a great, great he's, man, huh? He's a You're smiling. Tell me. Well, I'm smiling because uh, if you look at St Steven's legacy of work, uh, which is ongoing, um, and I told him that we should all be at your feet kneeling because the scope of it, Brilliant. when you go from Schindler's List to um, to Close Encounters, I mean, it's it really stunning in and its diversity. And let's go even further back, huh, shall we? Jaws and all of that. Really? Yeah. I mean, could you, what was he, 26 when he did Jaws? Yeah. It Pretty even goes amazing. the duel with Dennis Weaver. The, it was one of his first two for Roger Corman, I think. Um, he's a really warm guy and I think is really interested in being liked. Uh, he would tell a lot of great stories mm. about John Ford and all these old uh, and very influential directors. And uh, he chomps on a cigar and he's a, a family man. I was going to say, he keeps it tight. He's a family guy. He's got many kids. Lives not far from where we are. And I know that, you know, he does a lot at school. 
Yeah. You know, he and his wife, um, first wife and second wife, I mean, he's, he's at the school a lot. He's with the family. Why are you smiling again? What? Well, I'm smiling because I did a, a movie uh, with his wife, Kate, um, called The Quick and the Dead in like 1986 with Sam Elliott. And, oh, another know, fine actor. Wow. Yeah, he's terrific. Wow. Um, I, uh, I got on the set, and I'm, I'm no fool at the time. I was single, and I, I took one look at Kate Capshaw, and I went, I, so I called her up for dinner, and she went, no, and slammed the phone down. And I, I said, well. That's demoralizing. Not really. Uh, I guess I'm cocky enough to not be demoralized. But um, I, I, so I thought, well, I guess if you're a successful Hollywood actress, you have to be kind of cold because you're probably getting hit on all the time. But so 17 years later, I'm working on Minority Report and she comes on the set and I, I, I go up to her and I go, Ms. Capshaw, you may not remember, but we did a movie 17 years ago. And she turns on me and she goes, yeah, you and I had a thing for each other. <gasps> and I went, uh, you know, because Stephen, and I could see he was looking at us, was about 10, wow. 10 feet away. And I revere him and I didn't want him in any way uncomfortable. And, and so uh, I, I summoned myself up and I said... Yes, uh, I had the good taste to ask you out, and you had the good sense not to go. <laughs> and I was very proud of myself, and, and she said, well, I was being faithful to my married lover at the time, and she looked at Stephen. <laughs> and so oh. I, uh, that's why I was smiling, because it was one of those moments. But, um, you know, I, wow. I really revere Stephen. He's great. People don't really realize how much he shoots. He would give us... Uh, new scenes every day, and I, I, I kind of revel in that kind of uh, improvisational situation. And, and Wait, so uh, what does that mean? Like, let's say uh, he would do multiple shoots for one scene and see what she preferred, and then you were allowed to improvise something? Yeah, I mean, Minority Report, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie, sure. but they, we actually filmed stuff where I was the hero and saved Tom Cruise at the end. We, I understand why they chose a, a different path in that, yeah. but... Um, this, first of all, they were very security-minded about the script. I was one of four people that was given a script. Everybody else had to turn theirs in at the end of the day. Wow. And then you have Janusz Kaminski, who's a brilliant, brilliant cinematographer and probably the most profane human being on the planet. Um, I won't even say for your audience what's the things he says because he wants you to give it back to him. And he's kind of this counterpoint to Stephen, who's very warm and very gregarious. Oh, say for my so, audience, please. I'm sure they'd love to hear it. Well, let's, let's see if we can say he is. Uh, Janos would come up to me at the beginning of the day and he'd go, uh, I'm going to commit sodomy on you today. And oh. I, so... Um, so I'd say, and do whatever you will, light boy. I'd call him light boy. Oh, so it's so, one of those kind of things going on. Look, you should see some of the stuff that goes on in newsrooms. I mean, you yeah, know what I mean? I Just know. some stuff that you'd never really want to repeat. Yeah, That's all well, I can say. And that's, a, I got you. I know what you're he's saying. He's a very, very profane guy, and Stephen's a very, very warm, <laughs> genial guy. Sean uh, Connery. Sean, you know, I only worked with him, so I don't really. But what's interesting about Sean is, He's such a consummate actor that the accent that he gives in public is actually different from his real accent. Oh, isn't that interesting? He, How so? Well, his accent in real life is far more working class. Wow. I hear that about Jeremy Irons, too. Is that true? Someone once said that he taught himself to be a little more, you know, proper. But in fact, that his, ac his accent, <laughs> you like that accent? His accent is a little more rugged and everyday kind of a thing. Yeah, he's, his accent in real life is very, very much more working class. Yeah. You know, Sean is a man. And I was playing the villain, man against his man, and so it's like dog man eat dog man. kind of uh, interaction in the scene. I really enjoyed working with him. Have you ever gone up against a woman, though? The villain against, I mean, you played with Naomi Watts. No, I love the smiles she, she you was, give when I ask about people. Well, this is why the you're book, reflecting. You know, one of the reasons I wrote the book is I had so many stories, and if someone wants. Fantastic. Uh, authoritative stories from a captain who's been at the front for a long time in the war, then they should go to go to the book. Um, but also, it only just touches on these things in the book. There's so much you talk about, which we'll also get into. But just if well, you want a little back... There's another volume, back, too. Th that's another right. volume this, is all show business. But 
the, so, that's not out yet, or, or is it? No, it's short. Going to be out shortly. It's written, and it's just I'm uh, just about to. We had a five hundred and forty page manuscript, and uh, I made a decision that we wanted to divide it into two uh, volumes, simply because I think that's too much unless you're Norm, oh, I think so Norman too. Mailer. It's kind of like reading Moby Dick. You look at it, and it's just this big, and you think, how am I ever going to get through this thing? But you probably you have to explain to your audience who Moby Dick is. Uh, you may have to explain. Uh, anyway, I, I'm being cheeky. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, it's too much. You want to put out 200, three, 250, 300 pages. Plus you get two book tours out of it, so there you go. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm very happy with that decision because in the producing of this one, I've learned so much, particularly like recording the audio version will be out very soon, and um, that in itself is a rigorous journey. Did you do all the audio for your book? I did, yeah. You did. That's yeah, yeah. important. A lot of times people, you know, they have an actor, and, yeah. but, well, you are an actor, so... Um, I and I'm a voiceover be... artist. Um, I've done a, a fair amount of that, uh, and so. But the recording of a book over six pay, six days, seven or eight hours a day, is a very different uh, exercise than doing a commercial for a half an hour or an hour uh, with thirty or forty words. The title of your book, "Dying for Living," you said in it, "I'm not a moral man." May I go to something else you said. Um, when describing yourself, you are a single dad of two. We know now that you've just been engaged, though, which is lovely. Um, you're interested in politics. Is that redeeming to you that I've gotten engaged? Neither. I'm just happy for you if you're happy. <laughs> yeah, Honestly, yeah. No, for I me, if you're a happy guy, that's good lovely, for me. Lovely, extraordinary, sexy, beautiful, smart Ooh, lady. Very happy for you then. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you enjoy talking politics, fashion. You like talking um, about veterans and veterans' rights. Solar energy is an interest of yours, gun ownership, and Gandhi. Now, when you think about that, you got a lot of what's going on on the left and a lot of what's going on on the right. So as soon as I read that, I thought, no, this is an interesting man. He's a man who just sort of, um, you do your own thing. You don't really subscribe to any one political value, I imagine. You just lead by your heart, right? Well, that that in common sense, I hope. And I think there's a lot of Americans who are actually... Um, are looking for that and actually are looking for somebody to articulate that. And it really, that's what our country was founded on. You take a guy like Jefferson uh, or Benjamin Franklin, these guys weren't monodimensional. No. They were, I'm not comparing myself to those people, but they were highly, highly eclectic Renaissance Age of Enlightenment thinkers and involved in a lot of things. Right. We talked about that yesterday on the phone. I'm, and to me, uh, my guy is um, Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah, exactly. Because he was a scientist and he was an artist and he was able to see things from all vantage points, mm -hmm. which I agree with you. It makes, makes somebody very, very interesting to know, to talk to, et cetera. But um, what do you think politically? How are is going on? How do you feel about what's going on politically in the country? Well, I imagine you voted for Mr. Trump. I voted for uh, Mr. Trump and was, by the way, here's, I've come to the conclusion that my articulating my particular things, it doesn't necessarily dissuade anybody or change anybody's opinion. We're in this situation, we, we really ought to start listening to each other and oh, absolutely. coming to a conclusion for a solution to different things. I was very concerned, uh, certainly, by the way, I, I'd vote for a woman in a second. Uh, and an admirer of Golda Meir and uh, some great uh, female leaders. But I felt that uh, Ms. Clinton uh, represented a certain level of mismanagement and corruption and criminality. So I was happy to see us dodge that bullet as an American. Now, I understand there's a huge number of people who feel differently about that. But Which, by the way, is okay, and that's a democracy, and if you do, go vote on yeah, Tuesday. And, and let's talk about it I rather agree. than exclude each other from each other. So, uh, we are all in this sort of, I hope, eloquent conversation about what it is to be an American. Let's, let's take a thing like uh, the Confederate flag. I understand that says different things to a person of color than it says to somebody who maybe was born in Virginia uh, and, and came from a, def a set of circumstances. So that Confederate flag needs to come down for the, uh, all the Americans that that has that effect on. But we have to talk about that and not scream at each other as we're, uh, we're, we're going down this 
this conversation? Well, I think about anything, as we discussed, I just just returned from Morocco. And one thing that shocked me, I was in a pottery store and I, I was sitting there waiting for some friends. And someone said to me, uh, a Moroccan man said, how do you like Trump? I, I just laughed because I didn't really know what to say. I was assuming he didn't like him yeah. at all. He said, we love him here. I thought, oh, and then he, <laughs> you're laughing, you like my accents, huh? So he was proceeding to tell me why they like Trump there. He said, you're stronger now in business. I didn't say much of anything. I did not vote for Trump. You know, we have a divided household. The husband did. I didn't. It's okay. We can't talk about politics at home or that's it. So I just listened to him talk about yeah. why he thought we have a stronger economy on, on Trump. And I, I processed what he said be so in other words, I agree with you. We have to listen to each other, whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, or somewhere in between, which is where I am. Um, if we don't do that, we're really in a lot of trouble. Go vote. If the wrong, if the guy that you didn't vote or gal that you voted for didn't win, try again. You know, yeah. we need more representation, in my opinion, of women. There's not many of us out there, um, and you know, just keep keep going at it. But all of the continuous protesting, I personally don't think is getting us very far. I get it. I get it. Um, Morocco. Yes. One thing I learned over there, uh, we're not being told a bunch of things about Islam. Uh, everywhere I went in Morocco, an admittedly very secular place, they, uh, as far as an Islam uh, country goes, they made a big point of saying uh, Judaism is the first religion, Christianity is the second, and Islam is the third. And they, it was almost like the, everybody in the country was scripted on that. And it has... Uh, tablets in the in the uh, mosques that depict that. So Morocco is a very special place. You know, it's the first place that it recognized the United States of America, the first country in the world. And we have a very special. I didn't even know that. Yeah. No, and I had a great person who was taking me around and personal guide who was just taking. Seventeen seventy nine. They recognized America, and we have a very special trade relationship with them that doesn't involve any kind of tariffs or, or taxes or anything. So well, it's, no wonder why they like us. <laughs> well, and they're and also they don't have oil, so they're very dedicated to tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never met such welcoming, uh, authentic people. Some of that is, oh, here's the action actor, and I, we've seen everything he's ever done, and. Blue, bootleg copies, but uh, a lot of it is in their DNA. They're very hospitable people. Um, I found that to be true as well. Everyone, yeah. people at the, now granted, I mean, I'm seeing it through the eyes of a tourist, and, and we toured well, let's just put it that way, went to some yeah. very, very interesting places. And um, very often I like to get lost, which I will do. Yeah. And we will literally, literally, we'll just ditch, you know, our friends, ditch everybody and go along little side alleys. Clearly, we look like tourists, but I right. try and just disappear on my own and peer into windows and see little restaurants that the locals are going to. That's how I like to travel, but clearly, I still look like a tourist. But um, I, I loved it. I enjoyed the people, learned a lot about yeah, how they look at us. Yeah, people should go there. And the Selman, did you go to the Selman Hotel? Everybody on the planet no? should sometime have a stay in a place like the Selman Hotel. Where was that? That's in Mar uh, Marrakesh, and it was founded by a friend of the royal families, and they, they have the uh, Arabian stallions there. I mean, it's a privilege oh, yes. just to see yes. these horses. Um, wow. No, but I, yeah. I know exactly when you're talking. They we have a pool, very close by. It was a pool that's about 125 yards long. Um, it's just exquisite living. And we got there at Ramadan, so I was prepared for a little bit of their going to – loathe these European type people and it, it wasn't the case at all. Okay, I came to really love and appreciate the call to prayer, I yeah, guess, yeah. five times a day. Mm -hmm. The first time I heard it, I thought, what is this? I mean, I actually was a little frightened. Sure. So, when, this is true. When I came home in the morning, mm -hmm. back in California, you know, you're groggy, you're jet lagged, and I heard zzz outside of my house and I thought, mm -hmm. What happened? And I suddenly felt like I was back there, but it was my gardeners out there. And I thought, oh, my gosh. I thought it was a call to prayer. I got very accustomed. I think you've got the, the, the revolution yeah, going the on outside yeah, I know. We, we keep our, our yeah, studio door they've open. They've got a bunch of pitchforks. Well, no, you know in. why I keep it open? Because it gets so hot in here. I like yeah, it. Yeah. And I don't even mind if I hear them. It's like, oh, hello. Anyway, so back to your book. Back to you. Yeah. Um, but I found it interesting that you say um, – you vote for the man or woman. 
You are clearly someone who is believes in gun ownership and is a gun guy, but you're also interested in solar energy and the environment. In other words, you're I don't think those things are incompatible. They're not. Bingo. They're not They're at not all. They're not at all. I mean, if you if you spend any time in Colorado or someplace like that, or even rural Connecticut, you know, uh, caring about the environment and caring uh, 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 having a rifle is is not incompatible. Just like uh, liking the glamour of Hollywood, but being able to exist. Um, in uh, with down to earth values in in Ohio is not incompatible. Yeah. One of the things we're that all I'm, one people, whether here, Ohio, Colorado, Morocco, anywhere, right? Yeah. I mean, on uh, on some fundamental level and a lot of levels, we are. We've got to all the same thing. One thing about Morocco I wanted to add is I really got to see how Islam actually provides hope for those people. Um, which is probably something we don't gravitate towards here as much as we might because we don't have experience with it. Yeah. Um, do I think Islam has oppressive elements? Yes, I do. But doesn't Particularly everything? Particularly the women. Does, doesn't well, everything? Think certain about institutions, do, yeah, every institution does. And it's our job as adults to sort that out and make sure that I like to think, I call it the Jefferson ideal, but we have to remember Jefferson didn't free his slaves. And so um, therein lies a juxtaposition or a flaw Absolutely. or whatever that needs to be reconciled in our conversation. Why did you want to write this book? Well, there were a couple of... Why'd you do it? I mean, what motive... Of, is, I've yeah. been a writer for 50 yes. years. You know, I wrote for every magazine in New York, most of the ad agency. The you truth, started your career as a journalist. I fact. did. I got out of college. All I wanted to do was be a writer, and so that's what I became in New York. Um, one, I, this is going to sound funny, but people would gather and tell stories, and I always had a story that topped the one that went before, and I didn't want to... I love a guy like you. Well, no, I didn't want to... Um, uh, I began to feel bad because I was sort of <laughs> emasculating the person who told the story. But you me. have a wealth of life that you've lived. <laughs> yes, Seriously. One does not wish to live going around and trumping everybody else's stories. So the other thing was, uh, <laughs> so I wanted to entertain this lady that I'm engaged uh, to, so I would send her, send her a story a week, and I ended up with a draft. Uh, the other was... I wanted to articulate um, a form of patriotism that I came from. Uh, I, I had a very special background where my mother had some mental illness but was highly accomplished, and my father was the most extraordinary guy that I've ever met. He struck out George Bush to win the National Collegiate Baseball Championship, was a World War II hero, wow. um, was an underwater demolition team guy, a precursor to the Navy oh, wow. SEALs, and founded Cigna Corporation. So I had a very privileged background, but a very uh, sort of violent, volatile one because of my mother's uh, illness. So there was that. And I wanted to examine why I ended up playing villains all the time. I wanted to... Uh, to you don't look like a priest, though. I know offense. A priest? Yeah, that's what I mean. You I look have like... played a priest, but it's always a serial killer priest. <laughs> and in fact, I have a movie coming out called Catalyst, yeah. where I am... This is interesting uh, to me. It's interesting. Um, I play a pedophilic priest. Oh. And what could be more reviled than a pedophilic priest? But what I learned from studying research about pedophilia um, is their illness is uncomfortably close to some other things, either abusive relationships, overeating, drug addiction. It's uncomfortably close to um, s stuff that probably lives in all of us, not the pedophilia part, the ad the addiction and the abusive origins. Well, look, we are so imperfect. Yeah. And it doesn't even matter who to blame. We're just human beings, and, you know, no matter, even if you have the most perfect little upbringing, right? Sometimes you look at people and you go, really? The perfect four kids, the lovely little family. There's Something's nobody. lurking under there. So no matter what, you know, we are just sort of flawed, but in a strange way, perfect too. If yeah. that makes sense. You know, you Anytime just... somebody says, I had a normal upbringing, I'm always going, okay, well, that's the curse then. There's that... who you have to be suspect <laughs> that's of. That's the curse. I once went on a hike with someone that I'd just gotten to know, and he said to me, eh, I just have sort of a normal kind of upbringing. I'm the most boring guy you'll ever meet. And I thought, 
okay, something wrong with this one. And as it turned out, yeah. Serial so, killer um, material. <laughs> almost. <laughs> almost. So um, I'm with you there. But I just find you to be so interesting. Is there a well, part you. in this book that's kind of your favorite? I mean, you know, it took it took a while. I didn't read the whole thing, I'll confess. But it took me a while just because it's well written. And it's oh, not. Thank you very no, much. No, but it's not just a simple little read. Like there's a lot in each in each paragraph. You know, you talk a lot about your early life. You talk a lot about your family, about being a single dad. Um, you're a good dad. I know that. Yeah, I was a much better dad than I was then as a husband. Um, uh, and I, I took some of the things that I took from my mother's infidelity, which was very graphically, uh, I witnessed it. And oh. um, that was spun me out. Um, so... Um, is there one part that I like more than that? No, Just I'm also, I'm also would... trying to convey to how do you become an actor and what makes me be able to play a serial killer uh, with, with the facility that I developed. But it's really, I mean, I'm playing the president of the United States. One would, some people would say, well, that's just not so far from a serial One killer. Same. Some but um, um, I, uh, you know, it's just acting. You know, I've often had uh, directors be, after I've worked with ask, "Was God was he really difficult on the set?" Because that looked, I'm hardly that. I'm uh, deliver the goods. It's really, it's all. Isn't life about delivering the goods, Deborah? Yes, of course. If you're and a doctor, if, you're a yes, and you're an actor, and if you're playing a villain, you got to tap into the villain within. I mean, there's a villain within all of us. Well, I, I, I want to make clear: cinema villainy is often very, very different from. Uh, from uh, real life villainy. Um, uh, cinema villainy is often uh, much more sort of hyper reality and I try to, you're, you're trying to arouse people, you're trying scare to- Scare them. Uh, maybe, uh, yes, scare them. Sometimes real life villainy is extremely banal. I mean, some of the most virulent people in the history of mankind have been extraordinarily evil, but they're kind of boring, really. Boring real and life. often charming. Yeah. Um, so you try to get a mix of impulses in cinema villainy, um, just as you would if you were playing a very, very good man. Where's the? I mean, look, Hitler was a vegan. Hitler the, was a this, vegan. Yeah, he was. And no, the, I've read that. At the same time, he. He loved his dog, but he poisoned his dog first to test the poison that he took his own life with, if you believe that he actually died there. And there's a lot of evidence that he didn't die in Berlin. Yeah, I know. I've read, I mean, so many different stories on him, how he died. Did he die? Was he roaming around? I mean, and I don't know. Um, why? What do you If thinking? I was a betting man, I'd say he made it out and got to Argentina. Um... There's, I mean, I'm again, speechless you know, just because we I'm live thinking, in an age where could you, you even, can, wait, wait, could you even imagine, right, finding yeah. Hitler in Argentina? Well, there How are horrifying. people who believe they did, you know. Well, there are people, and there's a lot of evidence to say they're right. I'm not going to come down one way or the other, but if I was a betting person, I might bet, you know. And how did he get some there? Cash. Well, they had a pipeline uh, for Nazis at the close of World War II. And, by the way, mm -hmm. the U United States wisely, if you think in terms of geopolitics, geopol took a lot of the Nazis. Our whole space program was under the uh, umbrella wisdom of Werner von Braun, uh, who was – they have pictures of him standing on a rocket scaffold with ha people hanging in the background, the slave labor. So um, we took the best minds. Thank the Lord we got them rather than the Soviet Union. Um, oh, that's true. So that was a good move geopolitically. But there was a lot of uh, aid and comfort that was giving, given to Nazi hierarchy out of uh, Germany at the close of World War II into Argentina. Wow. You are a fascinating man. This is why this is a must read, everybody. I'm telling you. Dying for living. Terrific. Part one of a two-part series. God, God love you. I mean, yeah. you've got so much going on from being the villain into such major, major, major motion pictures to writing and just talking about politics and your thoughts on the world. You're you're a fascinating and, and really a brilliant guy. Well, next so, time we'll talk about Me Too and some other things. Want to talk about what? Mention the website. 
Oh, website. yeah. Go ahead. Your publicist and, is right next to you. She's poking him. A friend of mine, yeah, Eileen. Is, uh, Don't Eileen. forget the website. Um, uh, there's Amazon.com for digital. There's Amazon.com for hardcover. There's Barnes & Nobles for hardcover. And there's also a link on our ads for an autographed copy. If you can't make it to one of our signings, we'll have sign oh, wonderful. signings all over the country. But the website is? Uh, PatrickKilpatrick.com. PatrickKilpatrick. Dot com. Yeah, just go to the Emporium page and you can purchase an autographed copy. And don't forget, well. I want you to sign mine before you leave here. It's too I will. To read. Absolutely. And the Me Too movement. Gosh, I wish we had time. Because, all right, can you sum it up in one minute? Thoughts on Me Too and then we're out of here. Well, t perfectly appropriate and glad that the monsters have been driven out uh, uh, of a. Uh, there's humor involved in it and stuff like that. At the same time, very interesting little fa unknown fact. If you run an acting class, you can't even get insurance now because of the number of claims. So that's a, a fact that people... Look, if people want to know the insides and outs from a captain who's been there for a long, long time, dying for a living. We'll, Read we'll Dying for a Living. On for, onward There's a cliffhanger to get you to go buy the book. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, I Deborah. really, really Thank enjoyed you. it. And um, thanks for being here. Um, and I hope everybody has a great night tonight for Halloween. Are you going to a party or anything for Halloween? I am. I'm going to a what party. What are you going to be? Oh, please tell me. A villain? I'm going as a Moroccan. You're going as a Moroccan? Yeah. Uh, oh. Why? Because I bought some fashion over there, stuff that it's about time I used. But I'm going, the hostess, the, I have, she's incredibly beautiful, and she's also insists that you bring a big present and a bottle of Cristal champagne. Oh, thank God, my party. To, I don't have to bring any of that. I just show up. Well, I, I never insist that people do this. This woman is a bit of a queen, and she, uh, she uh, insists. So go as a Moroccan prince, I guess. Oh, my gosh, my friend picked up like 10 of those, you know, the pants. You know, the, oh, yeah. kind of like yeah, yeah. He, he's in love with them. He keeps posting pictures of himself. My husband didn't get any. Well, of I've them. got a velvet jacket that's finally going to see some wear. Yeah, I'm either going as Wilma Flintstone or, or I'm going as a witch on my broom. It depends upon the, the you know, how I'm feeling at like seven o'clock at night. So anyway, happy Halloween to happy everybody. Halloween. Um, enjoy yourselves and Patrick Kilpatrick.com. We'll see you all next time. Bye bye.